In Thailand, they have a series of exams for the monks, and they have a corresponding set of exams for lay people. For the lay people, they have a special text on the ceremonies for making merit. And they divide merit-making ceremonies into two types, those that are auspicious and those that are inauspicious. The auspicious ones have to do with house blessings, other positive events in life. The inauspicious ones are the ones that have to do with death. Funeral services or services over the years when you want to make merit for someone who's passed away. The idea that those ceremonies are inauspicious is not a Buddhist one. It's Brahmanical. Because the Buddha said one of the highest blessings is heedfulness in terms of mental qualities. And when you go to a funeral, it reminds you we're all subject to death, especially when someone is close. This morning we got the news that Kwikkanok Tabloka, someone I know from Thailand, known for a long time, had passed away. And she was a very admirable person, very even in her moods. Years back when I was giving a talk to her, part of a retreat, got to the topic of generosity. We were talking about right and wrong attitudes to have toward generosity, and I wanted to give an example of something that was really right. And I thought at the time that we built the jetty in Wat Thomasitid, and she'd been there from very early on. At that point she was still a new student of John Fung's. One of her good friends had invited her to come and meditate a little bit with John Fung. And soon after she started, then the project for the jetty started. It became very obvious very quickly that we weren't going to be able to hire anybody. So the John Fung students in Bangkok got together and said, okay, we'll volunteer, we'll do the work ourselves. And so she came along every weekend. They would gather after work at this one woman's house in Bangkok. She would provide them with a dinner. They'd get in a, in a truck, sitting in the back of the truck, and then they'd drive out to the monastery, arrive usually around 10, 11 o'clock at night, sometimes midnight. In some cases they'd get right to work, because there was going to be a cement pouring on Saturday night. And so they would work and rest and work and rest, pretty much around the clock until the cement pouring. Then Sunday they'd do a little extra work, spend the night at what time I said, get up at 3 a.m., drive into Bangkok and go straight to work. They kept this up for months after months until the jetty was done. And she was one of the people. In later years we talked about this and we would laugh. We were young at that time and we could do things like that. Now that we're getting older, there'd be no way we could have done that. Of course, now she's gone on to another lifetime. We don't know where. But at least she has that fund of the goodness that she did when she was able to. And this is something that we should all take to heart. What, whatever goodness we're capable of doing, we should do now when we have the opportunity. Because the opportunity is not always there. Some people like to put things off. What are you putting it off for? When you get older, it just gets harder. But when you're young, you can do things that stretch you, and you don't break. So you will stretch yourself in doing something really good. It's not that she's gone. She's one of the people, when I would go back to Thailand, we would sit around and reminisce about how the jetty was built. And there was a really good sense of family feeling around the people who worked together on it. People coming from all kinds of backgrounds, including a, a Western monk. But it was all part of the same family, because we're working on something good together. 
Now there's one less person who can remember. This is one of the things you get struck with as life moves on, moves on, as the years add, add up, is how little is left of the earlier years. And how, with the passage of time, fewer and fewer people are around to actually tell from their own experience, well, what happened? I went back to what Thomas said a couple years back, and they arranged for a, a young monk to greet me and take me around. We started talking. He asked me questions about a John Fu and about the building of the jetty and you know, the buildings there. And so I told him what I'd remembered. And at the end he said this was very different from what he'd heard. So things pass away and there's nothing left, except for the goodness you do. Of course, there's the badness you do can also follow you, but you want to hold on to the goodness. Because we do all have something bad in our background, either things that we did that were not so good or things that other people did to us. And the Buddha says you don't want to focus on those. You want to have something better to focus on. Of course, the building of the jetty was, a, as John Fung used to say, heavy merit, whereas meditation is light merit. The light merit you can take with you wherever you go. The heavy merit has good memories, but those memories can get obscured. But if you have the skills of meditation, they can help you. So that's what you want to take. That's what you want to develop. And of those skills, thoughts of universal goodwill, compassion, empathetic joy, and equanimity are really important. Because both in dealing with things that you did that were not skillful, and things that other people did to you that were not skillful. The Buddha has you think in larger terms. Things that other people do to you. The Buddha would give the example of the bandits with the two-handled saw, trying to saw off your limbs. He said, even in a case like that, you should not have ill will for them, you should have goodwill instead. And starting with them, and then goodwill for the whole universe. For several reasons. One is that Having ill will will pull you down. And two, that if you can develop a larger sense of the whole universe as your object of thought, it pulls you out of the particularities of your own suffering. To do it puts it into context. You're not the only one dying. You're not the only one in the universe being mistreated. When you look at, think of the larger context, of course you think of the Buddha's second knowledge in the night of his awakening, when he saw beings passing away and being reborn in line with their actions. And you realize those poor bandits, they're setting themselves up for a fall. You can actually have compassion for them as you step back from the immediate experience. In the same in cases where you've done something wrong. The Buddha said you learn from the Buddha that killing, stealing, illicit sex, lying, taking intoxicants, these things are all unskillful. And you can think back, and you've done unskillful things in your life. As you said, the proper response to that is not to get wound up in remorse, it's simply to recognize well, that was a mistake. And you resolve not to repeat the mistake, and then you develop thoughts of goodwill again for everybody. Thoughts of Compassion, empathetic joy, equanimity. Partly to reinforce your determination not to repeat the mistake, and also to pull you out of that narrative. Again, it just becomes one more instance of all the stupid things that all beings have done. And think about the amount of suffering that's gone on. pulls you out of the narrative, as I said. Then you can have some compassion for yourself and for all the other beings. Now remember, in the Buddha's case, when he had that second knowledge, it then led to coming back into the present moment, not in terms of the narratives, 
but in terms of what is it that drives beings to keep on doing this again and again and again. So it's advisable that you learn how to develop this larger perspective and then think about, well, where does this apply to me right now? And what can I do to get out? It's in this case that the Buddha discovered the Four Noble Truths. He realized the problem was the craving in the mind that led to all these actions that caused suffering. But that craving could be ended through the factors of the Noble Eightfold Path. And so he carried out the duties with regard to those Four Noble Truths and was able to reach the cessation of suffering. So that larger perspective is helpful in many ways. It gets you out of the particulars of your narrative and then gives you the ability to see, well, where is the problem? Because when the Buddha had that vision of beings dying and being reborn, it was in line with their actions, and their actions were determined by their intentions, and their intentions were shaped by their views. Which is why he said in that verse that stands at the beginning of the Dhammapada, the mind is the forerunner of all things. Everything you're going to experience comes out of the mind. So if you're really heedful, you're going to focus on the training of the mind to develop these skills. So as aging, illness, and death come, you don't do anything foolish. And before they come, you realize, okay, you've got the opportunity to do some good, both inside and outside. When I talked to No shortly before she died, that's what I reminded her. And she said she'd been meditating. I said, well, this is what you've got to do from now on, nothing but meditate. And she said she knew that. So I encouraged her even further. So she's an example of someone who did good things for the people around her, and also made sure that she had some skills to take with her as she faced the difficulties that we're all bound to meet in life. So in this case, making merit for someone who's passed away can be an auspicious experience. If we learn how to look at our own lives and realize what needs to be done, that we've got to be heedful to do whatever good we can while we have the power to do it. Because that goodness will provide us with support. As the Buddha said, the goodness we've done is like relatives. When we get to the other side, that goodness will meet with us. In the same way that relatives will welcome, welcome us after we've been parted for a long time. 